Now, we are with the second part of the chapter of the autoimmune collagen disorders. I have here to point that two lectures are not enough by all means to master this chapter. I'm just giving you an introduction, an explanation to some uh, uh, mysterious points. I'm giving you a clue to study in the reference written here, which is Andrew's Diseases of the Skin, the last edition of the year 2020. In the last lecture, in the first one, we were studying together. I tried to explain some of the points about the lupus erythematosus spectrum. And in this lecture, I'm going to introduce you to the world of dermatomyositis, scleroderma, and some other autoimmune collagen disorders. Let's start with dermatomyositis. The etiopathogenesis of dermatomyositis goes through the three major lines of all the autoimmune collagen disorders as we started with the lupus in the first lecture. There is hereditary predisposition and there is autoimmune mechanism leading to destruction of the tissues and there are precipitating factors. Here characteristically in dermatomyositis the autoimmune mechanism working in dermatomyositis is mainly the humoral immunity, while in polymyositis it's a cytotoxic T lymphocytes, a cell mediated immunity that is taking the lead in the tissue attack. Precipitated by in adult onset dermatomyositis, we have always to search for internal malignancy, being it a solid tumor in one of the internal organs or a hematologic disorder malignancy. Almost one third of the patients manifest the malignancy before the dermatomyositis, within two years before dermatomyositis. One third the malignancy shows itself with dermatomyositis and the last one-third may appear in two years after the appearance of dermatomyositis. So internal malignancy is very important in dermatomyositis as a precipitating factor and should be sought for. On the other hand, viral or streptococcal infections may precipitate dermatomyositis in adults but more commonly in children. So, we'll go back to the three main lines of autoimmune disorders. We have a hereditary predisposition, we have precipitating factors, and we have an autoimmune mechanism attacking the body. Skin manifestations of dermatomyositis, some are characteristic and we should know them. Gotron papules are flat-topped, polygonal, violaceous papules, like in planus like, and they prefer the dorsa of the joints, mainly the joints of the hand, the metacarpals, but they may appear on bigger joints like the elbows and the knees. And the gotral signs, which is a scaly erythematous papular rash, affecting again the dorsa of the hands, the forearms and the legs and the dorsa uh, uh, of the feet, or may show in an inverse form favoring the palms and the ventral surfaces. Heliotrope erythema and edema. Heliotrope here refers to the flower you see its picture beside in, the, in this slide. Heliotrope erythema occurs in the eyelids and it is a reaction to dermatomyositis affection of the orbicularis oculi. So affection 
of the eyelid muscles, of the eye muscles, myositis. The reaction appears on the skin with erythema and edema. The erythema here is a bit dark, taking the, violace, the violaceous or pinkish hue of the heliotrope flower. Dermatomyositis affects the striated muscles, the voluntary muscles. So we've seen it in the eye muscles, but it affects mainly the big muscles of the limb girdles so it affects the shoulder girdle and the skin above is erythematous and edematous in a shower like pattern or affects the pelvic girdle and the skin is erythematous and edematous in a holster like pattern patients of dermatomyositis show marked photosensitivity Telangiectasia is evident whether in photosensitive areas and in nail folds. Long-standing cases will show poikiloderma with mottled pigmentation, hyper and hypo, with atrophy and with telangiectasia. The hands here, hands of the patients with dermatomyositis, classically show hyperkeratosis, fissures, and they have somehow a dirty look. They call it a mechanics hand. Rash of the body may show scaly erythema, edema, bully, ulcers, and the condition may show scaly erythematous patches with palmoplantar keratosis. It's showing like the PRP, Petriasis rubra pilaris, and this is the Wong variant of dermatomyositis. Pruritus is marked and may be disturbing to the patient. So these are the classic clinical manifestations on the skin of the patient with dermatomyositis. We may see some of them, not all of them, but they are diagnostic when present. As we mentioned, dermatomyositis have two peaks, one adult onset and one child onset. In adult onset, with the skin manifestations, there is a fraction of the limb girdle muscles as we just mentioned we have the three stages it starts with weakness and aching and then pain and tenderness appear and ends up with atrophy of the affected muscle affection beside the limb girdles may affect other muscles in the limb girdles mind you when it affects the shoulder girdle the patient cannot raise his upper limb above the head cannot touch the other ear over the head. When it affects the pelvic girdle, the patient finds it very difficult to raise from a sitting position. Affection of anterior neck muscles, muscles of speech, muscles of deglutition, may affect the functions of these muscles, and they will appear. And ocular muscles, we just mentioned them. Patients of dermatomyositis die from interstitial lung fibrosis which is common and devastating pulmonary hypertension with reactionary heart failure myocarditis or of course from the underlying malignancy that initiated precipitated the appearance of dermatomyositis as usual with long-standing destructive tissue affection calcinosis of the skin and muscle may occur these are some of the internet photos. Here we see the affection of the eye muscles with heliotrope erythema. Here again, some heliotrope erythema, some conjunctival conjunction, some uh, photo, photosensitivity with erythema and edema in the sun exposed area. Here taking even the uh, V area and extending to the shoulders in a uh, shawl like sign juvenile dermatomyositis we have two variants one of them is acute and the other is chronic the chronic form the Bernstein type it's slowly progressive it's non-fatal with no relation to internal malignancy but the problem with these 
kids is that it stays for a long time that calcinosis universalis is usual to happen if the patients are not treated, diagnosed and treated early, and this is disabling for life. The other variant is the banker type, which is an acute killing form of the disorder. It is widespread vasculitis affecting the skin, subcutaneous tissue, gastrointestinal and internal organs, and it is fatal if not diagnosed in proper time. Criteria for diagnosis, again as put by the American uh, uh, College of Rheumatology, we have the characteristic skin lesions. We mentioned them, mainly the heliotropy erythema, the gotrons papules, and the gotrons sign. Plus four of the following. Muscle pain and tenderness, proximal muscle weakness, elevated serum levels of muscle enzymes, characteristic changes in electromyography, characteristic inflammatory changes in muscle biopsy and magnetic resonance imaging, positive anti-GO1 antibody. So, characteristic skin lesions plus one, two, three, four, five, and six muscle changes. This is dermatomyositis. Non-destructive arthritis or arthralgia, systemic inflammatory signs like the fever, lethargy, loss of weight, whatever. So these are the criteria for the diagnosis. Characteristic skin lesions because we are talking about dermato skin. And some of the myositis criteria affection explained to you, written in front of you in the present slide. Investigating a case, we start as usual with a complete blood picture and erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Muscle enzymes are of crucial importance here to diagnosis. Aldolase, creatinine phosphokinase, lactic dehydrogenase, aspartate transaminase, and alanine aminotransferase. Antinuclear antibody positivity here is between 60 and 80 percent in different references. So, as we mentioned in lupus erythematosus, antinuclear antibody is the most sensitive test for autoimmune collagen disorders, yet it is the least specific, but it helps in screening. Anti-GO antibody and anti-MI2 antibodies are the classic two autoantibodies, the oldest ones de uh, uh, detected, and they are the most important among almost one dozen autoantibodies that research declares in dermatomyositis. Just remember these two with the antinuclear antibody, with the clinical picture of the muscle enzymes, that would be fair enough to diagnose the case. Now, the barium swallow here, we talked about the muscles of deglutition. So, the upper part of the uh, uh, gastrointestinal tract, the part that of the pharynx, we may find some pharyngeal pouches secondary to weakness of the striated muscles surrounding the pharynx, muscles of deglutition. Chest X-ray, important for the diagnosis and prognosis of the life of this patient. MRI, echocardiography and pulmonary functions. Those patients, when they die, if it's not from the malignancy, it's from the affection of the cardiopulmonary system. Muscle biopsy, electromyography, and MRI for the muscles are, again, of the diagnostic criteria. We may need them. And every effort should be done to detect the internal malignancy. The usual age-related screening testing is not enough in these cases. We have to exhaust ourselves, not the patient. We exhaust ourselves thinking and directing the investigations to search for the internal malignancy. Because of this, we mentioned them and we have always to remember an underlying malignancy, lung affection with interstitial lung disease, respiratory muscle weakness, striated muscles. Here we are talking about the affection of striated muscles of respiration, 
Aspiration secondary to dysphagia, we just mentioned that. And with the immunosuppression, there may be repeated infections in these weak lungs with the aspirations. And the cardiac failure, whether it's secondary to affection of the heart muscles or in most of the cases to pulmonary hypertension. That looks like the dermatomyositis but lacks the characteristic skin lesions of the dermatomyositis. Serologically and affection of the muscles, the antisynthase syndrome, antisynthase JO1 antibodies, myositis, arthritis, rainous phenomena, interstitial lung disease, fever, and mechanics hand. Just few of the skin lesions of dermatomyositis, it is a distinct syndrome that we should be aware of because, again, it affects the quality of life and it may be fatal. To treat dermatomyositis, we have to exclude and treat underlying malignancy. We give systemic steroids. Mind you, systemic steroids may lead to some muscle weakness. So, if the muscle weakness after initial improvement uh, gets worse again, we should consider that it's the effect of steroids not due to reactivation of dermatomyositis, so we do not need to increase the systemic steroids. We have to evaluate the general condition of the patient all in all. And cytotoxic drugs, please go through the references and see the old and new cytotoxic drugs used to save the amount of steroids and maybe some of the new biologics used with some success and a lot of failures. The other disease is scleroderma. Scleroderma appears in many forms, either localized morphia or generalized morphia. In localized morphia, Sclerosis affects the skin and deeper tissues. No affection of internal organs. It may be circumscribed to the plaque or gut tape, small dot-like. It may be extend deep, it's profunda. Or it may show atrophy like in atrophoderma of Pacini and Pirini affecting usually part of the trunk. This morphia may appear linear affecting one limb sometimes, by the way, in the trunk, or affecting the frontoparietal area with or without hemiatrophy of the face. When it affects the frontoparietal area, the French called it en coup de sabre, like, uh, uh, like a strike by a sword. And it may be affected by facial hemiatrophy, where there is loss of the uh, uh, subcutaneous tissue, part of the dermis, and atrophy of some atrophy of the muscles, maybe associated with epilepsy, exophthalmus, and it's called the Perry Romberg syndrome. Generalized morphia. In generalized morphia, there is sclerosis. It's diffuse. It starts in the trunk, and again, there is no systemic involvement. Uh, the French used to call it en cuirasse, as if wearing some shield over the chest, like protecting in a battle. And we have the systemic sclerosis, where there is affection of internal organs. It's a multi-system disorder, where connective tissue sclerosis and atrophy are associated with widespread vasculitis and autoimmune changes. Here we are talking again about a spectrum, like the spectrum of lupus erythematosus, where we have localized forms affecting the skin, and these forms affecting the skin may affect wide areas of the skin, be generalized. And we have the systemic form, like the systemic lupus erythematosus, we have the systemic sclerosis. This systemic sclerosis may have, may be associated with diffuse cutaneous affection, diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis or limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis, or the CREST syndrome, where the CREST are eponyms for calcinosis cutis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal 
this motility, sclerodactyly, and transjectility. With generalized affection of the skin in systemic sclerosis, the affection starts peripheral, starts at the sclerodactyly, starts at the finger tips at the hands and it spreads then centripetal, it spreads proximal. This is in contrast to generalized morphia where the affection starts in the center, in the trunk and spreads centrifugally to the periphery. Let's read together. We have sclerodactyly sclerosis of the fingers. This may be associated with uh, loss of the finger uh, pad, fingertip pad. It may affect the movement of the uh, metacarpal joints. Raynaud's phenomenon is very important here. We may have digital ulceration, abnormal nail fold capillaries in systemic sclerosis in dermatomyositis and in mixed connective tissue disorder and in systemic lupus erythematosus too are important findings. Contractures of course, sclerosis. When the sclerosis affects the face, we have parrot beak nose when the nose is tapered down. We have pursing mouth with right teeth and the mouth is surrounded by longitudinal atrophic scarring. We have the mask face with sclerosis, the expressions are masked, and pruritus. Gastroesophageal regurg here occurs because of the affection of the lower two thirds or even one third of the esophagus. Affection here is of the involuntary smooth muscles, not like dermatomyositis where the affection is of the voluntary deglutition striated muscles of the upper half of the gastrointestinal tract. So we have affection of the lower esophagus, we have affection of the stomach with atrophic gastric mucosa with achlorhydria, we have atrophic intestinal mucosa with loss of prestasis and resultant constipation. Interstitial lung disease is the major cause of death. Cardiac myositis and cardiac pulmonary failure may occur. We have interstitial kidney fibrosis and sclerodema renal crisis. Scleroderma renal crisis. Systemic sclerosis, this is very important. High, the highest case specific mortality in any autoimmune collagen disorders. Once systemic sclerosis is in its complete form, it's very difficult to reverse the change that happened. And if it affects the lung, the patient will suffer until death. So early diagnosis and early intervention are very important to save the life and to try to improve the quality of life of the unfortunate human being. Etiopathogenesis here is threefold as usual, but it's different than what we said with dermatomyositis and lupus. We have abnormal vascular response, abnormal fibrocyte function, abnormal immune reaction. Abnormal vascular response, we said that it's crucial for diagnosis. Early we find the Reynolds phenomenon that will inject the abnormal capillary loops. Abnormal fibrocyte function because sclerosis is actually deposition of abnormal collagen, thick areas of abnormal collagen, unhealthy collagen that obliterate part of the uh, 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 appendages present in the dermis, make the skin thicker and unhealthy, and even affect the blood vessel supply of the affected areas. May result in ulceration, as we said. This is with the abnormal vascular response. The abnormal immune reaction. I love this very old drawing in one of our old books from the 80s, maybe. Again, we are talking about an autoimmune mechanism. This autoimmune mechanism stimulates the T cells, where the T helper cells stimulate the B cells to produce the autoantibodies, the characteristic two antibodies in systemic sclerosis, the SCL70 antibody and the anti-centromere antibody. T-cells 
release their lymphokines to stimulate proliferation and increase collagen synthesis. And the autoimmune mechanism stimulates the monocyte macrophage, again ending up in stimulation of the fibrocytes to be very active depositing collagen, but again this collagen formation is incomplete and unhealthy. Scleroderma and systemic sclerosis are diagnosed clinically very easy and we may need skin biopsy. Mind you here, to detect that the collagen is thick in this area, you will have to take either a large biopsy, including part of the normal looking clinically normal skin, to compare the thickness of the collagen between the two parts, the affected and the non-affected, or to search for the eccrine loops. Usually, eccrine loops are present at the depth of the dermis, the end depth of the dermis. But with the thickness of the dermis here, we find the eccrine loop within the upper half of the dermis. This means that the collagen here is thicker, the dermis is thicker than usual. Barium soil here should be made in supine position. Just imagine a patient with abnormal, uh, weak, lower half of the esophagus, lost prostasis, and if he drinks the barium while in a prone position, standing, the barium will just trickle down to the stock. But if the patient is in a supine position, we'll find a level, fluid level, for the barium. It's resulting, it's staying there, redundant there, in the lax esophagus. The two autoantibodies we just mentioned, SCL70 autoantibodies, is positive in diffused cutaneous progressive systemic sclerosis, is characteristic, and the anti-centromere antibodies are positive in limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis and in the CREST syndrome. Scleroderma may be associated with dermatomyositis, so we have sclerodermatomyositis, and it may be associated with lichen sclerosis etatrophica. This is a true overlap and is present at diagnosis, where we find the biopsy in some areas typical of lichen sclerosis etatrophica and in other areas typical of scleroderm. Bone, joint, and muscle involvement occurs, again, secondary to the scarring to limitation of movements. Long-acting lesions will end up in, with calcinosis, like we have passed through with dermatomyositis and with lupus erythematosus. GIT infection we just mentioned, ocular involvement, gingival, gingival affection, pulmonary fibrosis is the most common cause of death with heart failure. This is very miserable. Once the condition is full-blown, classic, complete, there is no curative treatment. So, early diagnosis, early intervention in localized cases uh, in the skin, they may benefit from intralesional triumph syndrome, acetonide, PUVA, or some physiotherapy with ultrasound sonic massage. Then we can try some of the uh, uh, drugs that help the passage of the blood through the affected vessels, like nifedipine pentoxifilin, we may use seldenafil uh, for the lung affection in high doses, ginkgo biloba, and physiotherapy. These are some photos with plate morphia, all from the internet, open sites. Again, plate a linear morphia in one of these. Onco de sabre affecting the forehead. Progressive systemic sclerosis, we see tapering of the fingers and uh, the affection of the mouth and of the nose. Loss of expressions from the face. Here we see clearly affection of the mouth with the purse string appearance. And here's a uh, histopathology showing how big and thick the dermis is with the homogeneous collagen, which is abnormal. 
the same bit. Now, few other dermatoses you have to pass through. Please, I'm just introducing the subjects to the candidates and you have to go through your textbook, your reference to study them. Isinophilic fasciitis. Isinophilic fasciitis is considered by some as a, a part of scleroderma and some references refer to it as a, an entity by itself. The affection here is of the fascia surrounding the muscles. It prefers the limbs. We see the pain affecting the distal parts of the limbs and the edema and weakness affecting the proximal parts of the limbs. Isenophilic fasciitis typically starts after sternness exercise or sternness effort. A couple of weeks after massive muscular effort, Isenophilic fasciitis may, be, may uh, be precipitated, may appear in predisposed persons. Recent research suggests that, again, internal malignancy and microbial proteins may precipitate isenophilic fasciitis in some people. We see the dimpling of the skin and the edema, and raising the limb will show a groove sign, dry river bed sign, where there's part of the skin over a major vessel is depressed with the elevation of the limb. Again, this is an autoimmune collagen disorder with inflammation, steroid may help. The condition is usually, if not, there is, if there is no underlying malignancy, the condition is self-limiting, but again, within weeks and months. So it's better to start treatment early. Sometimes scleroderma is initiated by some diseases, and we call this pseudoscleroderma because this is not actually the autoimmune sclerosis that we, saw, uh, we see in scleroderma and in progressive systemic sclerosis. The term pseudoscleroderma is not mentioned in our reference here, Andrew's disease of the skin, but it was mentioned in Rook textbook of dermatology, and I see it very convenient to follow. Look with me, pass through these headlines for some diseases that may uh, uh, initiate some sclerosis of the skin that looks like scleroderma, but it's not scleroderma. For example, with porphyria, cutanea, tarda, the scarring occurs may mimic scleroderma, phenylcutinuria. Primary stem myelodosis, scurvy, and diabetes may make some changes that look like scleroderma. Systemic lupus erythematosus, dermatomyositis, and rheumatoid arthritis may be associated with some sclerosis of the skin. Scleridema and sclerimixedema. Progeria, acrogeria. Chronic intoxications with organic solvents, epoxy resins, pesticides, and silica. Now, this is important. People working in uh, 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 electric appliances and the television factories, they use epoxy resins. People working in uh, mines, they may be exposed to silica, or in marble factories, they may be exposed to silica, silica dust. People exposed to organic solvents or pesticides while they work, they may develop skin lesions looking like scleroderma with affection of the lungs and liver and sometimes the central nervous system. Bleomycin injected used to be classically injected for treatment of basal cell carcinoma, may end up in a sclerosed part. Paraffin implants, thank God they don't put them anymore, but silicone implants are surrounded by fibrosis and sometimes the skin above may be turgid like in scleroderma. Late phase chronic graft versus host disorder ends up in sclerosis of the skin. So this is just a quick revision of the diseases that may induce skin changes that look like scleroderma. Other autoimmune collagen disorders, we have the mixed connective tissue disease, Jigger syndrome, rheumatoid nodules, 
lichen sclerosis is a tropicus. I'm just giving you a summary. Please go back to your reference. I'm helping you to go through your reference by putting the important points, points uh, to remember and to understand what's happening in the disease. Mixed connective tissue disease or disorder is an entity by itself. It's different from the undetermined connective tissue disorder, where the condition is vague and it goes through one of the tracks like systemic lupus or dermatomyositis or scleroderma. Here we have the characters of the three clinically mixed together in this patient. It's a mixture of systemic lupus erythematosus, dermatomyositis, and systemic sclerosis. Clinically, there's facial erythema, photosensitivity, rash, myositis, sausage-shaped swollen fingers, dysphagia, abnormal nail fold capillaries, rhinus phenomenon is very important, arthritis, arthralgia, orogenital ulcers, and psychoneurotic manifestations. We have mixture of the three major autoimmune collagen disorders together here, so it's mixed connective tissue disease. Now, investigations. This is very characteristic. We have speckled antinuclear antibody pattern by direct immunofluorescence in epidermal cells of affected skin. This is the specific test here. We don't see this speckled antinuclear antibody in the epidermal cells by direct immunofluorescence in any of the other diseases. I remind you of the lupus band test. We see the granular deposits in a linear form along the derm epidermal junction, nothing in the epidermal cells. So this is characteristic of the mixed connective tissue disease. And this, it shows that this is a unique disorder, not following the lines of any of the three major connective tissue disorders. This is number one. Number two, positive serum anti-ribonucleoprotein antibody and a particular pattern of antinuclear antibody by indirect immunofluorescence. So these are diagnostic for mixed connective tissue disorders. Jugren syndrome, Sika syndrome. You should all remember the Sika Jugren syndrome from the undergraduate studies. We passed through this when we were young, undergraduates, in the ENT and in ophthalmology courses. The sick syndrome could be primary without association with any other autoimmune connective tissue disorder or maybe secondary associated with any of them, mainly systemic loops. The sick syndrome, zero stomia, you have dry mouth, zero salmia, dry eyes, zero derma, dry skin, and arthritis. This is a classic. Subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus have the anti antibodies, SSA like Jugren syndrome, sweet syndrome like lesions, vitiligo, amyloidosis, they all may be associated with the Sika syndrome. Biopsy shows focal infiltrate of lymphocytes and plasma cells of minor salivary glands and lacrimal glands. Don't take biopsy from the skin here. And the biopsy here goes to the secretory parts, salivary and lacrimal glands. And as we mentioned, it's positive Rho and La antibodies. I did not mention the treatment with Jugren syndrome or mixed connective tissue disorders. Please go through your textbook and search for that. Important here is to learn how to diagnose and the important points in every disease to make things short and easy for you. And thank you.